Hello, the nice people at Runcam sent me one of these hybrid cameras to take a look at. I think I was supposed to get this a couple of weeks ago actually, but uh, it only arrived a few days ago, so I'm late to the party on this again, unfortunately. But anyway, this is one of these cameras that we've been seeing a few of lately from some other manufacturers, and they're starting to put the HD camera and the FPV camera as their own separate lenses and sensors, and they're sort of stuck together. And we can do that these days because all this stuff is getting so small that even when you do this it still fits inside your mini quad frame and doesn't stick out too much if you were putting it on the top of your plane and so on. Yeah so other than the um, obvious features here there are actually a few other things that are not, not so obvious but I'll just list them up quickly here so we have individual sensors uh, it's 4k capable that's the HD camera of course you can use a QR code on your phone or your tablet to change the HD camera settings not the FPV camera settings unfortunately just the HD camera settings but nevertheless that is quite convenient because it means you don't need uh, Wi-Fi or anything like that to to get a connection and it's quite quick and easy uh, the FPV camera settings can be changed in the traditional way that we've seen in the past with a little joystick with the little buttons where you go click 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 to change it and it can also be changed via a flight controller like a beta flight flight controller through the UART connection and as far as I know, this is the first camera that can do both of those. Usually it's all either been joystick or UART. The firmware of the FPV camera can be updated as well. I haven't tried that. I'm not sure why you would need to do that really, but it is kind of neat that you can do that. And I think that's also a first for a Runcam camera. Usually when you buy an FPV camera, the firmware is just on there and you can't do anything about it. Uh, the HD camera, of course, in the past, we have been able to change the firmware and you do that by putting a file on the SD card when it starts up it'll check for that file um, unfortunately <laughs> the firmware of the FPV camera again is different so there's quite a few differences it's, it's not really a hybrid I think hybrid the word hybrid means two things are sort of mixed together but this is almost like two separate things are just attached to each other so it's like a thing stuck together I don't know what's a good word for that but hybrid is not doesn't seem to be quite right to my mind but anyway, uh, to change the firmware on the FPV camera, uh, you need a, I think you need to do that through a Betaflight or iNav style flight controller through the UART connection, and you need a smartphone to do that. So that firmware update is not quite as convenient, but it is interesting nonetheless that you can change the firmware on the FPV camera. Uh, and the weight of this whole thing is 18 grams, which is pretty neat, and it's on a single board, which is quite convenient. Uh, I've just stuck it on this... Um, piece of cardboard this is actually from the top of the run cam box which is quite handy this is what was in the box looking a little bit sparse compared to what we've seen previously notably absent is a little mounting bracket that they usually include or they used to include to mount it onto your mini quad or something uh, and it looks like they're not not including the joystick thing anymore either by the way that uh, this is the what I'm calling a joystick or keypad or whatever uh, you can get these on Runcam's site for three dollars so it's not like it's a huge cost or anything but uh, it might be a bit of a surprise if you thought you were going to be getting one of these and you didn't and you didn't have any way to uh, change the settings for the FPV camera so what you need to do is cut this wire here and solder it onto some little pads here those ones up there a couple of those somewhere one of them and this is the uh, mounting thing so you're going to want a 19 millimeter wide one of these Here's a bit closer look at the main board. The mounting holes are 20 millimeters, but the board itself is a little bit bigger. It's more like about 29 millimeters square. And I think these pads here actually is where you connect the the joystick thing that we were just looking at. Up in the top left, this thing here that looks a bit like a barometer. I think that might actually be a microphone. Does anyone know? <laughs> I think I've seen microphones that look like that before. The audio on this camera is surprisingly good when you're just sort of talking at normal conversation level. Um, not when it's flying though unfortunately when it's flying the audio is completely terrible at least in the one that I've got it seems to be a bit of a struggle for run cam the audio doesn't it they they just <laughs> can't seem to get it quite right uh, this is the other side so we've got the SD card it's a push push oh the cable has been changed from a ribbon to this sort of a one that goes into like a roundy cable and it's quite nice and flexible and it makes it much easier to position things um, and on top of the SD card they've changed from using a metal tab to a plastic one and this is much more pleasant to use I've found 
I actually didn't use the middle one because it, it seemed to make a rattling noise and I suspect they might have also had issues with the middle tab touching on parts of the board maybe um, because it, it does sort of go all the way back here over this other stuff there which could have been an issue perhaps but anyway this one is much nicer uh, oh, this is just how I stuck it on my mini quad. Unfortunately, this was a bit of a fail because there was quite a bit of jello in the footage. I just did that to um, just to check how the latency felt. Um, oh, so one of the reasons for doing this thing with the separate cameras, I should have mentioned at the beginning. I think the reason that, that this is being done now is because the FPV camera needs to have very low latency, at least if you want to, you know, feel confident like a boss when you're flying around instead of a fumbling noob, and the amount of processing that the HD camera has to do is quite intense so I think it was beginning to slow down the latency that um, was able to be achieved if the FPV camera was also or the FPV output was coming through the HD camera maybe something like that I don't know but anyway um, this seems to be the trend and um, it's fine by me it seems to seems to work quite well the case that the camera is in this piece around the lenses and everything I think this is all metallic the back and this piece and it's sort of sandwiched around the circuit board in the middle which is quite nice so it's very well protected and it makes it very easy to stick onto things so for my testing I was just using some double-sided tape to stick on there and um, stick it onto the a piece of wood and stuff and it's very very nicely protected and it seems to be cooling itself quite well one of the other cameras that I looked at um, a while ago, I think it was either the Split or the Split Mini or something like that, uh, got quite hot around this area, but this one, it just gets a little bit warm, so that's a nice improvement. And yeah, it just has a nice sort of solid feeling. Some of those other <laughs> FPV cameras, they just had like a little flat piece of plastic on here, and it just sort of seemed flimsy, but um, this is a really nice, well-protected case. I, I quite like it. Oh yes, and I should have probably mentioned at the beginning, this is the, the price that you're looking at for one of these, 100 bucks. Um, I'll put a link in the description to this page, you can look at all that stuff on your own time, I guess. Uh, there's just a couple of things in the manual that I wanted to look at which are new. Uh, most of the manual is just stuff, we've seen it all before. But with the, um, the new things are that the FPV camera can be controlled either by joystick or UART, and that the FPV camera's firmware can be modified or updated. So the way you uh, select between using the joystick control or the UART control uh, is a, a little bit odd so that's why I thought I'd mention it. So what you do is, well if you're like me and you wanted to use the joystick control you don't have to do anything, you just solder your joystick connections on there um, as they show like this, joystick control, those two pads, clicky clicky keypad thing and away you go. Um, <clears throat> but if you wanted to use the UART control through your flight controller to um, mess with the FPV camera settings, what you need to do is first short these two pins, power the camera up and then it will automatically switch between those two modes and you'll see on the screen like that there, joystick control or UART control and when it's on the one that you want then you turn the power off or, oh hang on, no, unplug the short circuit cable Hmm. Um, so it's a bit odd, but anyway, that's how you would do that. And the UART connection works with bed flight 3.3 or above, etc, etc. And the other thing I wanted to look at here in the manual is how you update the firmware of the FPV camera, because this is also a little bit kind of weird. It's a pity that they couldn't have just done this by um, putting the file on the SD card in the same way that you update the HD camera firmware. But like I say, they seem to be quite separate things, even though they're all bundled into one package. So the way you update the FPV firmware is you need to do this through Betaflight. Presumably it doesn't say that you need Betaflight but it says uh, uh, connect it up to your flight controller so it's, presumably it's it's going to be uh, you're going to need one of these flight controllers. I, I don't think it would work with ArduPilot or anything so for me personally this is kind of a nuisance. There we go, these ones here. Um, so operating on a presumption that you need one of those flight controllers and you need a flight controller in the first place I'm not going to be doing this uh, it's just too much of a nuisance and on top of that then you also need the app the SpeedyB app and obviously you need a, a smartphone to do this so it's a whole lot more uh, awkward than just putting a file on the SD card which you can do with any old laptop and you don't need a 
flight control at all. But anyway, um, it at least is possible to change the firmware of the FPV camera now, so it's a step forward, I suppose. Now, changing the settings for the HD camera, on the other hand, is very convenient. So you just uh, get the app, if you don't have it already, and you select your settings here, and then you click Apply, and it shows you this QR code, and, uh, well, you need to set up the camera first, so uh, by default, when you turn the camera on, it's probably going to be auto-recording, so you hit that button to stop it recording, then you'll get a solid blue light. And this button here is the mode button, and you hold that for a second or so, and it will show you a green light. And the green light will stay on until it sees that. So you've got to just sort of hold it there. And um, like it says on here, it can be a little bit tricky on sunny days. Or well, it doesn't quite say that, but that's you know that's that's basically what it's saying there. But I haven't had any trouble with it, and it's every time it's managed to recognise the QR code within about two seconds or so, even on a sunny situation. So I'm I'm really happy with this. I, I, I like this system and you can just sort of confirm down here uh, the settings that you've chosen. There are a few more. So there's a general tab there as well. So I'll just quickly show you what you're able to change. And I have not changed anything on here in the tests that I'm about to show you other than resolution. So everything that you're seeing is just um, what it would be running like straight out of the box. So I did a side-by-side -side comparison with some other cameras, as I often do, and is it worth doing that, by the way? I, I know back in the day, cameras used to be, like, the difference between them was quite marked as each new camera came out, but these days it seems to be not quite such a difference. So let me know if these side-by-side -side comparisons are not really worth it, because uh, it would be a hell of a lot easier to make a video and less editing and everything if I just, if all I had to do was just show you what the new camera was like. Uh, anyway, so I decided to use the Runcam Racer for the FPV and the Runcam 3S for the HD comparison. These are probably the, the better ones that I have to do a comparison with. And I just wanted to show you this here. This is my uh, setup for doing the side-by-side -side thing. It's just a couple of mini DVRs to record the FPV output. And I'm powering this all from a 3S battery, which goes through this little switching regulator, which steps the voltage down to 5 volts and everything ran beautifully. Then the next day, I put this on the on the Mini Talon, and I had the FPV output going through the Omnibus F4 Pro flight controller to get the OSD display overlaid on, onto it so that I could you know, see the altitude and stuff on my goggles. And I had seen somewhere in the manual, and also the run cam representative told me, uh, it's a good idea not to power this directly from full battery voltage because you might get uh, voltage spikes and stuff. So I think what they mean is that you're supposed to either put a filter in to filter out the spikes, like one of these simple things, or use uh, a lower voltage. This uh, functions as a sort of a filter as well. This, this in here is just another one of the... It's the same as the thing I have on there. And this is also at 5 volts. And I, So I thought, well, that would be fine, wouldn't it? But for whatever reason, you just don't get any FPV feed, FPV signal coming out to your goggles. And I think it's something to do with the interaction between the flight controller and, and the, this camera somehow, because the HD camera was fine. The footage was recording. I could see the little LED going. And when I checked the SD card afterwards, the, the HD footage was all recorded. It's only the FPV signal output that just doesn't seem to work for whatever reason. And I've discovered this before. I first discovered it with the Runcam 3S, which also does it. And so I experimented a little bit, and I found that the... This is... Uh, what is this? Uh, Micro Eagle. This one also has that problem, but the Swift Mini and the Runcam 2, they don't have that problem. So I don't really know what it is, but to make a long story short, the solution is use a higher voltage than 5 volts. So 5 volts is right on the the lower um, point of what they can take. Well, this one at least anyway. It's usually 5 volts. This is lower, lower of the voltage range. So just use full battery voltage, which is what I did, and that solved all my problems. Um, but just to be safe, I didn't power it directly from the battery. I put one of these things in between it just to hopefully smooth out any spikes that would be caused from the ESC switching and stuff. Anyway, so let's get on with it. Light. Dark. Light. Dark. Okay, so my mouth is about 
10-15 centimeters behind all of these cameras and the audio on the hybrid is actually surprisingly good. It's, um, it's set to low, I think, in the settings, but even so it's um, still much more usable as a hat cam kind of audio uh, than most of the other run cam cameras have been. So that's the sun up there, just about there behind the clouds. Now this is, I think this is like the worst situation for lighting where the sky is going to go all bright and the ground is going to go all black when I look in the wrong place which is about here <laughs> anyway that's that's what the test is about and I think the um, the Runcam 3S actually does pretty well in that situation which is why I've chosen this one as a comparison because I don't think that the hybrid is going to do quite so well with keeping the ground well lit in this situation. Let's see what it goes, does when we do bright to dark here. Bright, dark, bright. Well, what do you know? It's a sunny day. Haven't had many of these lately, but we've got one now, so I can do a little of this. <laughs> Looking at the sun and back again. I'm expecting that all of these cameras should do a really good job in this lighting situation. I mean, it doesn't get much better. If you can see the hawk over there, probably not.
So hopefully YouTube's compression doesn't mess with the quality of those videos too much. But the three main differences that I noticed was that the uh, the clarity of the image in the hybrid is quite a bit better, although that comes at a cost of bitrate. So this is the bitrate that we're looking here. This is the uh, the 3S at the top is about 30 megabits per second versus 44 or 45-ish for <clears throat> the hybrid, which is about 50% more and that is reflected in the file size as well. Uh, the audio of the hybrid is quite a bit better, at least until you start flying, as we'll see in a minute. <laughs> um, and interestingly, uh, they've started compressing the audio now. I didn't realize this before, but the audio in the Runcam 3S is just completely uncompressed PCM uh, 44 kilohertz audio, and it's taking up a fair bit of the file size relative to the video, which it doesn't really need to. And you can see that now that they're compressing it, it's, uh, it's way smaller. It's um, MP4 audio now. Uh, and the other main difference that I noticed was that the wide dynamic range of the hybrid is not really as good as the 3S. Uh, so personally, I don't mind losing a little bit of clarity to have nicer wide dynamic range. I'd, I'd rather have it balanced a bit better that way. Now when I was looking at the footage from the Sunny comparison, there were some fairly noticeable pops and clicks in the audio that I think were the fault of the camera and it's easy to see them when you're looking in the editor view like there's one there and probably can't hear it through my microphone here but let's just oh yeah you could probably hear that I guess um, and I don't know exactly what's causing this but I would assume that the audio is undergoing some sort of a compensation to make it a little bit louder when the surroundings are quiet and to make it a little bit quieter when things are noisy perhaps I don't know but anyway, if you look along here, it's easy to see where these are. There's one here, I think. Yep. Um, so I'll I'll play these for you properly so that you can hear what they sound like. And there's also a lot of hissing going on here. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll just play those for you now. do a really good job in this lighting situation. I mean it doesn't get much better. So I don't know what that's all about and it probably doesn't really matter because getting fussy about the audio is not really what these cameras are all about. I just thought I'd mention it in the interests of doing a, a complete review. And here's some onboard footage taken from the Mini Talon and there's just a couple of things to notice here. It's nice and sunny, so the video is really good. But the audio after launch is pretty horrendous. I'll just let a little bit of it play so you can hear what it sounds like. Headphone users, beware. And then I'll turn the volume right down because otherwise it would be just torture to <laughs> keep listening to it. And one other thing I noticed during this flight was a strange visual artifact that appears inside the lens flare when the sun is in the frame. And it appears roughly on the opposite side of the screen to where the sun is. So if you look in the bottom left as we approach here in the lens flare there, you'll see it looks a little bit like the top of a tree showing through. And it's not too bad right now because the sun is not central in the frame and it's not large in the frame because it's still... Um, fairly midday sort of a situation but when I tried this in the evening when the Sun was right on the horizon and much larger it was actually quite annoying to have this in the frame because the whole thing got larger and I could see that it wasn't a tree it looked a little bit like ice crystals or something growing from the bottom of the screen and it really did actually get in my way um, but I think 
this is just a problem with my unit that I have. It's not going to be something that's in everyone's camera. Um, maybe it's Bruce's uh, Uncle Bruce's reviewer's curse is coming to get me, perhaps. Regarding the 4K capability of this camera, I don't think I'm going to be using that too much because I'm quite happy with 1080p and I don't have a 4K monitor anyway. And it makes enormous files. Um, but I did do a little test flight. So on the Mini Talon, this is what we're looking at here. And 5 minutes flight took 2 gigabytes of disk space. And I don't think it's such a great idea to put this up on YouTube. For one thing, I'd have to make this whole video 4K just to show you a few minutes of 4K footage. So I'm not going to do that. But what I will do is I'll upload this whole 2 gigabytes file to my web server and I'll leave it there for a couple of months. I'll take it down after a while because it's such a waste of space otherwise. But um, yeah, so that'll let you see exactly what you'll get from uh, the, the raw output from the camera. And it's pretty damn good. To be honest, one of the reasons I did this test was just to check that they're not fibbing about the resolution of the sensor. So they, they say it's an 8 megapixel sensor. And I've seen some footage from cameras that say they're 4K, but when you look at it, it's, it just doesn't really look like it's actually 4K at all. Um, but what I'll do here is I'll take a little screenshot. Obviously, what you're looking at right now is not going to show you much, but... Um, I'll take a screenshot here and I'll just show you the ridge line here because that's that's probably about three and a half kilometers away but you can still see these trees fairly well uh, so let me just find that file and show you that okay this is the whole frame here and I was going to look at the trees along the top there so just to give you an idea of how much we're zooming in and what small fraction of the overall frame we're we're looking at that's uh, that's the reason I'm doing it this way <laughs> um, so there they are there there's a little bit of sort of a brightening or edge detection edge enhancement thing going on but it's not too excessive and oh this this image viewer is smoothing the pixels isn't it right so those are the actual pixels there but the point I was trying to make before is that it's not really fudging anything. It looks like it's a full 4K sensor being used to do this. Um, yeah, so quite impressive. So again, let's look at these trees and zoom out again. Maybe that's a better way to get an idea of just how many pixels there are in this image. So like we're, we're less than a quarter of the way zoomed out and we, even at this point we have a still quite a nice detailed scene. It's quite pretty, isn't it? It's New Zealand. It's like this everywhere. <laughs> not quite. Not almost, actually, but anyway. Yeah, so it's a real 4K sensor, folks. No, no fakery. So just to summarize all of this, I've listed up the pros and cons, at least according to me. And these are the pros here. There's quite a lot of them, actually. And I think we've covered all of them in the video already, so there's not really any need to discuss them any further here. Uh, you can just pause that if you want to remind yourself of what we looked at. Um, the cons, likewise, we've discussed everything except for the second one here about the QR code setting. So I'll just explain what I mean by this. Um, the way that the QR code setting works, it's a one-way thing from the phone or the tablet to the camera. There's no way for the tablet to fetch any information from the camera about what the current settings are. Um, so if you were to have two cameras that use the same system, let's say you had one on your Mini Talon and you had one on your on your Mini Quad or whatever, and, and you want to have different settings for each of those, it could be quite kind of a pain in the ass because you're going to have to try and remember which settings you had for everything on each of them when you go to change them again. Now, admittedly, you don't change settings very often, so this is probably a minor minor issue um, but I just think it would be kind of nice if in the app we could save a set of parameters as for example give it a name and say mini these are the settings for my mini talent or whatever and, the, and these are the settings for my mini quad and then you could just sort of fetch those settings again if you wanted to change it so uh, that would be a nice thing it's not in the camera this is just in the app I'm, I'm talking about anyway um, so this video is probably quite long enough already and I think we'll just leave it there. Thanks to Runcam for uh, providing me with this. And thanks to you for watching the video. See you next time.